So it's been over a year since I made this video talking about why I love the O3 adaptation of Full Metal Alchemist, with me not touching back on it in regards to how popular it did or continuing my thoughts on it since. And I have no other explanation than that than just, I forgot. But in light of this year marking the 20th anniversary of the anime, I wanted to take some time to talk about both adaptations and my general thoughts on them. Previously in my video I did my best to not compare the two, and here's pretty much going to be the opposite. I'm going to be comparing the two in terms of how they handle the story of the manga, the art direction and atmosphere of both series, the music, and just the overall impression. But before I do any of that, I'd like to read off and respond to a number of comments the video has received as my way of giving thanks. Also, it should go without saying, but don't harass anyone I show. Anyway, first comment. Brotherhood is trashed. I watched it all and only have memorable moment from it. It didn't make me care about any characters. Moving on. As it's no longer available to stream in the US, I actually paid for the Blu-ray collection, lol. Well, you're a better person than me. I understand why people don't like 2003 or like Brotherhood more, but I still feel 2003 was good, and I personally loved the ending. Actually, I did a bit of research into it, and apparently, if this is true, Brotherhood wasn't finished during the manga's serialization. Meaning that this series may very well have had an original ending. I say may very well because it was apparently reported in what I researched that Hiromu Arakawa, the creator, came in and gave Studio Bones the bullet points of basically what she was considering the ending to be, so that by the time the manga ended, the anime would be finished as well. It's one of those cases where I think the anime adaptation actually had a bit more influence to the source material than we might have actually thought, because the endings are pretty close to similar. They're definitely different, but they're pretty close in the grand scheme of things, at the very least in terms of the final episodes. Man, I love FMA 03, and I love that people are still talking about it. Honestly, same. I really love Full Metal Alchemist 2003, and like I said, I really think it's a shame that a lot of people just put this off simply because Brotherhood is more faithful by default. I mean, just because FMA 03 went down its original route doesn't automatically mean, unlike, say, The Promised Neverland, that what Studio Bones did was completely and utterly terrible. I do think there are, there are some good points that even 03 did better than Brotherhood. One of the things from FMA 2003 that's burned into my memory was the episode with the stone sickness epidemic. It was just so harrowing and depressing from beginning to end. Oh yeah, I actually forgot to talk about that. Um, so to anyone who hasn't actually seen the series, the stone sickness epidemic was actually sort of a filler in regards to giving Lust more character. And it actually, I personally think it succeeded. It was very morbid and dark and pretty fucking gruesome in the grand scheme of things. But it also gave more depth to Lust's character as a whole. Especially considering that later on she does play a major part in the story. And one of her first real appearances in the series, like outside of just a background character in the shadows, was in the fifth laboratory, basically holding Ed at gunpoint, telling him to cause mass murder. All for the sake of just wanting to be human. Like, it, like legitimately, I do think that O3 gives a, a lot of depth and complexity to its antagonists and villains. Like, it's really interesting. Conquer of Shambhala was not in 1960s Germany. It's the 1930s, especially with the Socialist Workers' Party, aka Nazis, coming into power. Yeah, that was a fuck up on my part. You can honestly tell, looking back at the video, how kind of rushed I was for time and everything that... I cut out a number of things and did very little research in the grand scheme of things when it came to talking about the series, but a lot of what I was talking about, like, my heart was still in the right place, you could definitely tell that. I actually did a bit of research after I made this video and realized my fucking mistake, and yeah, um, the Nazis was not a party that just sprung up overnight in the 1960s or something, no, it was a party that's been going on for literal decades. It's just, you know, yeah, I, I instinctively said 1960s because of World War II, you know? It just it, It's just instinctively there. It's much darker and encapsulates the dangers of associating yourself with homunculi, but also there being a far better origin story to the homunculi than Brotherhood, in my opinion. Although I still don't get a lot about Lyra as one. Okay, yeah, um, as far as I can tell in the grand scheme of things from how they talked about it, pretty much, uh, to paraphrase, Lyra was months behind her rent, Dante evicted her soul, yeeted out of her old crotchety body, and hijacked Lyra's. 
basically that yeah that was her whole thing she wanted to cheat death my heart stopped when i heard you say you actually liked wrath <laughs> I stand him to the ends of the earth, but almost everyone hates him for being annoying, Lamau. And I've just kind of come to expect that from almost everyone who talks about FMAO3. And then you kept going and talked about the reasons why you like him. Oh my god! <laughs> I feel you, honestly. I don't know what it is about anime, but when somebody isn't hulking around a giant ass sword or winning fights or like acting mature, Apparently that character is just absolutely fucking annoying and you know sometimes yeah, I get it. They're fucking annoying Absolutely, they're intentionally annoying But other times there's a legitimate reason and legitimate context to it I mean, okay if I were to play some of Wrath's scenes out of context Hey, keep it down! You're gonna wake them all up, you idiot! No! Shut it! Shut it! Shut it! That's dumb. What'd you do with the real ones you were born with? Yeah, absolutely. He would seem like the most fucking annoying ass character. But honestly, if I were to find out that I died when I was born and my mom tried to bring me back to life, turning me into a fucking monster and then just giving me up to uh, some spooky ass gate. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I probably would resent her for a long period of time, even going so far as to find another mother, which is exactly what Wrath did. Wrath is literally just a kid. That he's just a kid who just wanted a mom. And I know there are gonna be some people like, Oh my god, he has mommy issues. The kid wants his mommy. And honestly, there's a major difference between like some rich asshole or some parent who's abusive just crying down because of like something like mommy issues when they really should have fucking known better. And a kid who forgot everything about his past, had powers, and had faces to point his hatred towards. And I know there are gonna be people who write this off as completely and utterly bullshit and think that, well, that's just completely and utterly immature. I mean, you take a look at the characters from Brotherhood and that's a lot more mature. And you know what it makes me think of, like, Komi-san can't communicate? Let me explain. Later on in the series, there is a character that pops up that is complete and utter pessimist, that doesn't want to be friends with Komi, that doesn't want to, like, play any games like Nerf Guns or whatever, and it's just like, I, you know, I, I'm fuck this, I'm out. And it makes this whole big stink about, you know, like, this is all just childish, this is all immature, this isn't good, like, I hate this shit. But then someone who's actually a friend of Komi-san, uh, comes up and talks to this kid, and says, look, I can understand the feeling that it's gross to participate and play together. It feels so immature, right? But aren't the people who are actually afraid of this kind of stuff the most immature? Like, some people want to act like stuff like this is completely and utterly immature and maybe for, like, children or something, and it's not for grown-ups or anything. But in reality, like, their whole, their whole spiel and everything is pretty fucking immature in and of itself. Like, if more people were to take a look towards Wrath's character like I did, and actually analyze it, they would find that it's pretty complex, honestly. Especially in the movie, like, the fact that Wrath for two-thirds of the entirety of the movie doesn't actually talk, really goes to show just how much he's developed as a character. Like, before, he very much was a character that was just, he was just a kid. He just wanted a mom, he wanted parents. And in Congo Shambhala, he was pretty much left with nothing. Like, Sloth, who he considered to be his mom, died. Uh, he didn't want anything to do with Izumi. And Ed had died right in front of him. And on top of that, Izumi, like, the one person who, regardless of everything, even if she hated herself for doing it, still considered him to be her kid. And she was the one person who, despite the fact that she blames herself for what happened to her own kid, still tried to see him as her kid, and was the one person left who he could legitimately see in some way as a mom. And she ended up dying because of her condition. Yeah, the fact that this kid has been through so much, and on top of that, the fact that he has pretty much no one left who he could go home to or anything. Yeah, it's a lot. And his last moments, I shit you not, they brought me to tears because just the fact that this kid, like, he had nothing left 
and going out essentially the way he came into this world as human transmutation, which is actually pretty fitting and poetic, and being able to be reunited with Izumi and be in her loving arms in the end, like that's actually very beautiful. And I full on give props to Conqueror Shambhala for doing that. I know the movie has flaws, but for this character, it I definitely don't think there is any flaws personally. The general darker tone and darker look into the homunculi are aspects of O3 I've always loved, and however contrived you want to call the whole twist of our world connecting into theirs to the gate, the face-to-face -face between Dante and Edward where she tears apart the one worldview he's always held true, equivalent exchange, is so interesting to me. So this was kind of a point I did make that I think a lot of people actually had a bit of a problem with and disagreed with me on, and look. I'm not here to make you think like me, I'm just here to make you think, and possibly, I don't know, laugh or something? I, I don't fucking know. I, I, in the grand scheme of things, like, my main goal when I do these videos is not to go, hey, I'm right, you're wrong, suck it. My, <laughs> my, my main goal usually is to just discuss these anime, because that's what I like doing. I like to talk about stuff that I'm actually invested in. But there's, and this is a reason why you most likely will never see me do a video on Boruto. It's because generally when I try to make these discussions on places like, say, Discord, there are just people that want to be right. There are people that think my opinion doesn't correlate with their opinion, so automatically I'm wrong and I have to know it. I fucking hate this because I'm generally, I, I don't care about being right. I don't care about being wrong. In the grand scheme of things, all I'm trying to do is open up dialogue and, I don't know, talk about people with different perspectives in the grand scheme of things in a civil way. Like, that's really all I'm trying to do. And with O3, I'm really glad to find a lot of people who feel the same way and try to give their own thoughts and opinions to it. So, look, if you like the whole twist on the, on the world being the real world in O3, like, I'm happy for you. Good on you. Good for you. Personally, though, I don't personally think that way, regardless of what people tell me. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, when it comes to their whole twist, in concept, I like the idea, in practice, I don't know, personally, I, and I also think that this would have worked for Conqueror Shambhala too, personally, if they were to actually go more towards the whole idea of it being a parallel world, that being a mistress just without alchemy, which I guess you can argue is that, yeah, that's basically just Germany. But I mean, I, I, I'm just saying, same location, except no alchemy. And everyone that's been affected by Ed and whatnot are still alive and everything. Like, in that world, I definitely, I, personally, I think you could have still kept it being more complex and convoluted in the grand scheme of things. Like, I, I really think it could have worked out a little more like that. Personally, I, I don't know. Maybe it's because of the fact that they made Hughes a Nazi. I, I don't know. Maybe that's because of the fact. Maybe I don't know about you, but maybe I have a thing against a character like Maze Hughes becoming an anti-Semite. Even if it is like for the, the quote unquote, maybe he's doing it for the right reasons. The Nazis were still the bad guys. The Nazis were still fucking bad people. That's not up for debate. <laughs> I don't know, am I wrong? Am I wrong for wanting a character like Hughes to not be a Nazi? I, I I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm the wrong one. Maybe I'm the crazy one and you're all sane. Or maybe the plot twist, maybe you're all crazy and I'm the sane one. That'd be fucking convoluted. That'd be fucking complex. No, 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 no. I'm the crazy one and you're all sane. I, I, I see that now. I definitely see that. I, I'll keep that in mind for later. Alright, so with all that said, pretty much I think I can get on to what I wanted to talk about here. So I'm going to assume most of you at least heard of the story of Full Metal Alchemist, so I'm not going to spend time re-catching people up on it, and I'm not about to go into major detail about stuff. If you want to know my thoughts on O3, I made a video. If you want to know what Brotherhood is like, go watch it. But to give the essential premise, FMA is about two brothers who lost their bodies due to a failed attempt at bringing their mom back to life with magic- I mean, alchemy, and join the military to try and correct that while also coming across an underground organization of unorthodox beings that need them for something. That's pretty much the synopsis. Now then, onto the meat. 
In terms of the story, I already touched on this a little, but even though probably some of you who just skipped to this part of the video who are probably thinking if you actually haven't heard my thoughts on O3 that, well, Brotherhood is better by default because it covers the manga, therefore O3 is worse, which, sorry fucko, you're wrong on that one. O3 honestly is a pretty good focus on a more darker and even psychological take on Hiromu Arakawa's work. Even in the material it covers, it does a pretty good job at adapting her artwork at times, especially in the more dramatic moments like with Shao Tucker. While Brotherhood has that as well, it does at times feel a little too... back and forth. There are times in the series where it is pretty serious and cold every now and then, almost at an attempt at feeling somewhat distracting. The atmosphere goes from serious to comical pretty quick at times. To its credit, it doesn't always happen, but it does happen. O3 has comedy in it, but there are usually was some contextual reason for that. Usually. FMA Brotherhood's story kind of touches more in line of a particular shonen series, whereas I guess O3 would be more better in line as a seinen. Which to those who don't know what I mean by this exactly, shonen and seinen are demographics for marketing. For shonen, it's more geared towards teens, mostly teenage boys, whereas seinen is more geared towards young adults. Sometimes both of these demographics can combine, but FMA Brotherhood does not hit the same demographic as Berserk. The story in Brotherhood feels more like a scale on the level of the world, or at least on the level of a country, whereas O3 feels more secluded. Less scale, but more of a personal attachment. Personally, I think O3's story as a whole honestly fits FMA's initial story really well. The focus from the protagonist to antagonist feels more personal, whereas in Brotherhood, it feels more large-scale and strategized. Not to say either can't work, but personally, I don't think you have to put an entire country at stake to make a story have decent tension and carry investment. Which Brotherhood was capable of doing, but much of what was going on was focused up with the bigger picture. With O3, it felt more personal, more complex. As for the music, the music in both series are pretty good, and I've talked a bit on it before, but I'll add on to it here. I do enjoy O3's music a lot more due to variety for setting the atmosphere, whereas Brotherhood had less variety and more repetition. I don't understand why you keep falling in! I get fooled! I fell off what?! Now sit. Shake. Other paw. Down. Good. But, but the doctor said next week! Well, the baby just said now, and I'm pretty sure she gets to choose! <laughs> Style. Drop your gun. Cough it up, Cornello. That stone belongs to me now, and if you hand it over peacefully, I won't tell the people here what you've been doing. And after being caught, imprisoned, and executed, I've come back from a pit of fire to take my revenge on you, maggot! So he tricked you into coming here and then did this? Damn it, there's so many idiots whose asses I have to kick! That boy. I've never seen anyone look so defeated. That's what you saw? No. There was fire in those eyes. Here he comes. Brotherhood had variety in its music, but the majority of the music was kept to a handful of orchestral pieces on repeat, with rarely a change. Maybe once in a while there is a new piece, or maybe even they use the opening, but you get what I mean. More repetition, less variety. The other 3 had repetition too, but it also had variety. There were a handful of pieces that did get repeated, but there was also other pieces made in place of others at times as well. It's interesting, because doing a little looking into it, Brotherhood's soundtrack actually has more songs than O3 listed. Not by much, but still. The soundtrack in Brotherhood to me feels so familiar, because like I said, a handful of tracks have been repeated, rarely changing, so it's more noticeable hearing it. While the soundtrack in O3 feels less so at times due to its variety, making the overall tone of the soundtrack as a whole feel familiar while everything sounding like either a new tonal shift or an alternate take on a tonal shift. It's been enough time. We should see what we can do. To train the mind to its potential, you gotta train the body. My brother's a person, I'm telling you. And that means you guys are too. I don't wanna kill you. I can't. 
Both series have pretty distinct art direction and atmosphere. And I don't just mean in the obvious. Forgetting how each character is drawn animation-wise, look at these shots back to back and tell me if you can notice the difference with the atmosphere. Think you got it? Because here's how I see it. Harsh and cold, dark and warm. For the most part, this is the norm for both series, on its environment and its characters. Take Ed for instance. In Brotherhood, his attire of red and black, blonde hair and a braid and metal arm, design-wise, carries a lot to say about him. But in the series, to the eye, he's more... appealing in a sense. It's a softer and even warmer and or gentler appearance on the coloring similar to the painted backgrounds and foregrounds. There's this easy-going, warm feeling Brotherhood carries with its art direction, but there's also a definite dark and moody atmosphere. Now on the side of O3, Ed's same design in the series comes off as more... I'd say graphic. It's not just the heavy shading, it's how the lighting hits the clothing, it's the angle showing the character. Now to add in the animation styles, O3 has more detail even in similar fights. When characters were hurt, there were lines added to show and express that more prominently. In Brotherhood, that did happen, but, like, say the facial expressions? They were more simplified to show the general expression they needed to portray. This is most likely due to the fact that the animation industry has a lot of issues and it is a taxing job behind the scenes. And it is, and those animators need to be paid more and treated better. But still, when something needed to elicit an atmosphere of dread and horror, you can tell that the line work increased to emphasize that, and the voice talent in both Japanese and English go a long way. Don't look away, Rose. You need to see what happens when you try to bring a human to life. When you cross into God's territory, or whatever the hell it is, is this what you want? Look! For example, take the human transmutation scene in both O3 and Brotherhood. In O3, it's not just the atmosphere, but the way the failure is animated and drawn. It looks horrifying and absolutely very detailed. Whereas in Brotherhood, much of it blends into the dark basement it's in, honestly masking the horrific scene. It's still fucked up, but comparing these two shots side by side, which would you really remember more vividly? Now that isn't to say Brotherhood didn't have its fair share of detailed animation, by no means was it bad. And I'm not even talking about the fights here. Take the first time we see Greed get killed. In 03 it feels more... flat. Sort of stilted. I can imagine it took some of the artists a long time to draw the head layer by layer correctly, but still. Now in Brotherhood, it's bit by bit. Keep in mind, they had to have people animate this. They had to animate a head regenerating itself bit by bit, to recreate his head from before. Honestly, I'd say it's an impressive shot to look at already, but when you break down the fact that there were people who had to animate this frame by frame, every detail, every color, all of it had to be right or at least consistent, it's crazy just how solid it looks coming together. Knowing how hard animation is and that this wasn't a movie, it's understandable that they didn't focus on it for the entirety of the moment. As for criticism, last time I tackled a couple of flaws from O3, but I never really talked about all of them, rather only a few. Like, I didn't talk about the Rush Valley episode. Now you might be wondering what's so bad about this. Honestly, almost nothing. Except for one thing. This episode focuses more on Ed's character clinging to the use of alchemy and Winry being heartbroken that the work she's passionate about has been proven right about being sheep. So her solution? Have a girl she met a day ago take Ed's watch and have him try to catch her without alchemy to prove a point. No, on surface level, that doesn't seem like that big of a problem. But when you remember that the watch to him becomes a manifestation of the trauma and guilt he's racked himself over with, and having that be treated like a piece of jewelry to be pawned off for the sake of making a point? Yeah, that's fucked up. Having to carry around my guilty motivation in my pocket, like some sniveling little kid with a magic charm. I'm still wasting all this time here looking back. What's wasted? How can you say that? What about Grandma and me? We're a home that's always been here. Why do you want to keep shutting everything out? If you can snatch your precious watch back from her before she makes it to the pawn shop, then you win. 
What is wrong with you? No, seriously. What the fuck is actually wrong with you? Also, while I like the idea of Ed changing his arms to different metals, I'm gonna be real. It's just funny to have him use it like a fucking Glock. I will defeat you with the power of science and this gun I found. In terms of other characters like the homunculi, I'd say all of them. Bradley is the worst one. With every homunculus, there's some level of complexity in regards to their character, like Envy or Wrath. Bradley is pretty one-dimensional. They try to have him be given some sort of a god complex in a way with him as a homunculus, being that he seems to have a disdain for humans as well as humans who are well-versed in alchemy. In his eyes, alchemists are supposed to be better than normal humans. And that's interesting on its own, but... Him as a character never really falls through until the very end against Mustang. There's no such thing as God. We can't know that for sure. However, devils do exist. They're the alchemists who dare to get in my way. Speaking of Mustang... Uh, Alright, this criticism is a bit weird, honestly, because his character is legitimately good, and if you were to ask me which version I would prefer of him, I couldn't choose between this or Brotherhood. But there's something I wanted to bring up now in terms of a little research I did. So apparently in regards to Conqueror of Shambhala, there was actually going to be more story and focus towards the characters in between the end of the series and the start of the film, but it was cut for whatever reason. Which explains a lot when you think about it. As much as I love the film, I'ma be real, a number of character stories don't really feel well paced. Mustang in the film is posted out north and demoted, wrapped with what he did in the war in his shot eye, and any time he tries using flame alchemy it comes up. He doesn't show up again until the final third. Like, more time focused on these characters I would have loved, not unlike what Brotherhood did with the OVAs. Now with O3, there's a few different stories to talk about, but one thing I do like is its trek to the present. From episode 1, we jump to them as kids and then to Father Cornello, and then the series decides to step back and showcase everything that had happened from them as kids to Ed and the military and a celebrity, like with the episode Be Thou for the People or the other Elric brothers. It's also, in terms of an adaptation with an unfinished source, a good detour until they catch up with the series. Now, as for what O3 and Brotherhood cover on the manga, the one major criticism about Brotherhood is that the first 13 to 14 episodes blaze through so much of what O3 did. So much so that there's even stories and details they don't even bother to mention, which has led to some confusion about certain characters and even lines. You can't just go picking up any stray you see. It's not any stray. He called to me. He's wet and hungry. Can't we keep him? Brother? What now? Did you find a stray cat or something? There's stray cats and now this! Just how many animals can you stuff into that armor of yours, huh? Get rid of that! What a heartless thing to say! But in terms of criticism on O3's part, there was one moment that I think should have been kept in for the manga, and it's related to Nina and Tucker. Now, without a doubt, this is done so much better in 03, better paced and better told, and the added points of the military taking Nina in to experiment on her after Tucker was found out, which the fact that this was planned all along says a lot about the military, leading to not just Scar putting her out of her misery, but Ed desperately also trying to put her back together over and over again, like, there's a legitimate reason why many people say this is done better, and I 100% agree. But one criticism I do have on it is Al. Now, it's not on him or anything he said, actually on the contrary, it's rather a lack of what he said. Upon holding Ed back from killing Tucker, he says this in the manga. Al's usually the calm and collected one, not prone to emotional outbursts as much as Ed, but this one line really shows just how much he's trying to hold himself back. As for the military, which is something I admit I didn't really bother to talk about in my vid, both are pretty damn good, honestly. Doing a little digging in, supposedly for the manga, Hiromu Arakawa actually talked to war veterans to make the story she was crafting feel more believable and fleshed out. Which honestly, I could see that being the case, because how they handled the war in Ishval is actually very layered. Here's how I see it. O3's take on the military and war is fairly sympathetic, while Brotherhood's take is more empathetic. O3 goes to some lengths in its telling, but Brotherhood feels like it carries layers of realism to it. The blurred lines, the chaos, the ideologies, the justifications, the people focused on are all people, and that's neither good nor bad. 
Even with Ishbal, the people massacred by Amestris. There's people that aren't all innocent and wanting and doing the right thing. And in the military, while there are people who never wish for things to happen like how it did, you have people like Kimberly who point out that this is exactly what you should have expected when you put on the uniform. Neither side is entirely innocent and good, nor guilty and heartless. It's complex. It's morally gray, more nuanced, so to speak. Even if characters like Hawkeye and Mustang or Armstrong and Hughes are likable and are doing the right things, there's no denying that their hands are all stained with blood. Hell, Armstrong, despite being a soldier, couldn't take what they were doing anymore and ran off the battlefield. Even if contributing to a genocide wasn't a good thing at all, he still abandoned his comrades who were putting their lives on the line while he walked away. He knows this and beats himself up for it. With O3, there's more of a focus on ideology versus reality. For example, Scar later on has a plan to make a Philosopher's Stone out of the soldiers of Amestris, while Ed opposes saying that the soldiers are people as well. However, and while the story alludes to it but never flat out says it, it's pretty obvious what happened. He didn't know that Rose had been taken to a military base by soldiers and raped, leading to her being so traumatized that she became unable to speak for an amount of time. There's a morally great factor here, but the story feels like a constant debate over, like I said, ideology and reality. Whereas in Brotherhood, the ideologies are formed from the reality, and the debates are based off of a focus towards accepting the world as is and desiring to change it for the better. Lastly, in terms of characters, when it comes to one of my favorites, Sloth, I'd like to add on more about her. Her existence, you could say, solidifies Ed's prejudice towards homunculi as monsters bearing the faces of humans, as, similar to Eckhart, he just sees them as monsters, despite how they look, talk, or even feel. Upon fighting Envy, whose sole power is deception through the appearance of others, he mentions how he killed Sloth while she was wearing the face of my own mother. Have you forgotten what I did to your friend Sloth? I killed her while she was wearing the face of my own mother. Really? That must have been very hard for you. Not even signifying that he went so far as to kill his own mother again, but rather killing something and or someone who took on the appearance of her. Sloth, however, is a complex character, as being given both the appearance and memories of Trisha Elric, there's this inferiority clawing away at Sloth to kill the both of them, but also an intertwined connection between them, not unlike Lust and Scar. Even in her last moments, there's this sense of satisfaction Sloth has in finally being able to be put to rest. While I believe Wrath was an embodiment of the stages of grief, Sloth to me represents the obsession and trauma both Ed and Al have with their mother being the driving force, which is fitting as soon after the focus on Ed and Al getting their bodies back has pretty much whittled away. Instead of that, it's rescuing Al from the homunculi and the debate of ideology versus reality comes back into play. The way I see it, it shifted from trying to go back to normal and coming to terms with what is normal now. Now after all of this, the general impression I have of both of them? O3 feels like a reality enveloped and or focused fantasy, whereas Brotherhood feels like a fantasy enveloped and or focused reality. Like how I mentioned before how O3 felt more harsh and cold while Brotherhood felt more dark and warm? That's contributed more I believe with this impression. O3 is a fantasy with a realistic mindset that has a harsh and cold focus, but Brotherhood as a reality with a more fantasy focused mindset is more dark yet warm. I joked earlier, but whereas Alchemy in O3 had this underlying and even morbid approach with a concept similar to magic and how it worked was like finding out soil and green as people, Brotherhood felt more like a magician revealing the secret of the trick they pulled. What looked like a magic trick was actually constructed in a specific way. Even the music helped sell the atmospheres of reality and fantasy respectively. All in all, both O3 and Brotherhood are very competent and very well done adaptations. I mean, at the end of the day, I've said this before, but I know for a fact that people are going to continue praising Brotherhood like it's a timeless classic. Personally, I'm fine with it. It's perfectly fine, it's okay, it doesn't matter. But still, it just makes me sad that people are more than willing to brush off O3 simply because it went off on its own and made its own story. Do I agree with everything done in O3, despite the fact that there are most likely a lot of people who really don't have much of a problem with it? No, but that's just me. Ultimately, at the end of the day, what I like and what I dislike is really my own preferences and opinions. And I'm really glad upon reading a lot of the comments that a lot of people really do feel that way. I mean, sure, some people may disagree with me, but at the end of the day, they still enjoy this show for what it is and they still love it. 
I can definitely see that. And if you want my opinion on the endings, yes, I still do prefer Brotherhoods. I know a lot of people prefer 03 and whatnot, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I personally, I just prefer Brotherhood's ending. Also because of the internet, now anytime I see the ending, I immediately think of the words fuck trophies, and that just makes me laugh the fuck out loud. Oh! <laughs> and that, they have fuck trophies in their children! <laughs> oh, I shipped that so hard, that Finn. Greatest You're not thing I've right. ever heard. Uh. <laughs> they have fuck trophies. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad I recorded that. <laughs> but yeah, this was a nice little video to do and everything. Well, I say little, but it's been over 30 fucking minutes. <laughs> but yeah, it was a nice video to do and everything. And, you know, all, all things considered, pretty much, it does make me happy to see that even to this day, there are still people that enjoy Full Metal Alchemist 2003 and are still willing to discuss it. It just makes me happy more than anything else. So yeah, thank you all so much for watching. Oh, the other movie. Right, that's a thing. Um, it's kind of shit. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong. It is nice to see a lot of great performances come back for Full Metal Alchemist and everything, especially with the introduction of Alexis Timpton and Matthew Mercer into a Full Metal Alchemist title. But all that considering... The story is kind of crap, and the characters are here or there. But with that said, I do think in the grand scheme of things, the whole focus around the Malosians and everything, in terms of how the story wanted to make its world building, I actually do think it's pretty good. It gets a little convoluted and out of control near the end, but yeah. Ultimately, in the end, though, I, personally, if I were to compare the two, Conqueror of Shambhala is the better film. The series has got good animation, fantastic acting, and really beautiful music. Don't get me wrong, I love the music. But, yeah, the story... Just, nah. I, I, I'm not for it. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay, are we done? Are we done here? Uh, uh, okay, I think we're done here. Alright, well, thank you all so much for watching, and uh, I'll see you all in the future. Peace. Peace. <laughs>